Hello everyone, welcome back to my video series, Code to Care. Uh, I again am pleased to welcome uh, Peter Lee, the, Dr. Peter Lee, the head of Microsoft Research um, to the series. I'm gonna welcome him in this circle here. Peter, it's great to have you back. Welcome. Hi, hi Don. I, I still get a little bit of a thrill uh, of being brought onto the screen this way. <laughs> yes, well, uh, well, it's it's, a, it's great. It's a new way to appear. It's, like, it's exciting. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is you wrote this great book a year ago, The AI Revolution in Medicine. Uh, we bought that for all of our employees. We wanted everybody to sort of appreciate the wonders of Gen AI, kind of like the way you went through it with your co-authors. And one of the things I enjoyed about the book, which I personally experienced, is just these aha moments. Like every month, I would get into Gen AI and it would just do something, you know, magical and some big leap forward. And that book really represents, I think, you and and your co-authors really kind of forging that trail for the rest of us in the industry. But the trail has continued even past writing the book. So I wonder if you can reflect on the aha moments, maybe key ones in the book, if you'd like to uh, recount those. But certainly since, um, you know, what, what have been the, the moments that Gen AI or AI in general has really amazed you? Sure. Um, you know, uh, that book we wrote in secret in the fall and winter of 2022. Um, you know, and so it's now what, two and a half years, sure, uh, sure. more than two and a half years. Um, but you know, it was also, that means it was written before GPT-4 was revealed to the world. And so, uh, when I, uh, reached out to, uh, Zach Kohani at Harvard Medical School, uh, and then to Kerry Goldberg, uh, who's a great science writer, um, we really wrote a book that was a work of pure speculation, you know, we, there was no real experience or evidence out in the world of what doctors and nurses and hospital administrators and so on patients would be using AI for. Uh, we just had to guess. And, you know, some things seem obvious. Um, you know, the whole idea of AI scribes sure. seemed obvious because way back in 2017, uh, here at Microsoft Research, uh, we started a project called Empower MD to create an AI that could listen to a doctor patient conversation and set up a clinical note. Um, and that project was really a very important project because uh, we had two collaborators. We had Joe Petro and his team at Nuance mm -hmm. uh, as a set of collaborators. And we had Dr. Shiv Rao at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center sure. um, as a collaborator. And so it was a kind of a three-way collaboration. Uh, and as time went on and you know, secretly within Microsoft, we were seeing the potential of generative AI, uh, but we weren't at liberty to share that with either Shiv Rao or with the Nuance team. Um, and then of course, um, you know, they had their own secrets that they weren't able to share with us. Um, we started down the road of trying to join forces and in fact did a merger with Nuance um, and UPMC Enterprises uh, their venture arm uh, agreed to fund, provide seed funding for Shiv Rao uh, to spin off his own company uh, for ambient clinical intelligence called a bridge. A bridge, of course. And so it's kind of an amazing thing that we could predict that things like this would happen and be super powered because of generative AI. Uh, but also for us at Microsoft Research to see leading products like Nuance Dragon Copilot or a bridge. Um, doing so well uh, in the marketplace. You know, I think, honestly, though, in the book, while it seemed for sure that this was going to happen, the actual emotional uh, and cognitive impact on doctors and nurses who have embraced this technology, uh, I'm, I didn't really understand the true emotional toll that things like note-taking and responding to patient emails and so on uh, uh, was taking on clinicians. And so to just see that in real life has been incredible. You know, a colleague of mine at UC San Diego Medicine, Chris Longhurst, related a story about this that really struck me. Uh, you know, he explained an obvious fact that patients sometimes are very frustrated with their health care. Mm -hmm. 
and can send some pretty angry emails to doctors. Ah, yes. And and it can be hard for a doctor to stay even keeled, you know, during pajama time responding sure. to those sure. things. Uh, and, you know, the idea of AI having infinite patience uh, to stay even tempered and provide useful responses, I think, is something that, you know, even for the obvious thing like ambient intelligence uh, has been a later aha moment. And of course, I think the bigger thing has been something we missed completely. I didn't really understand or realize at the time we were writing the book was how the transformer architecture that powers things like ChatGPT can make huge advances in other modalities such as radiology, pathology, genomics, uh, biomolecular dynamics, real world clinical data. And so just that generality of that AI architecture and its potential to do in those fields what it is doing for conversation, I think, has been a, a big aha moment uh, that uh, that way back in the fall of 2022, uh, I had no ability to to foresee. Yeah, maybe I could have you elaborate on that, because I've, I've seen you talk about this, that we kind of built that transformer architecture to understand language. But what you're finding in Microsoft Research is that it's really kind of understanding biology or understanding kind of the natural natural world somehow, even though it kind of wasn't built built for that. Maybe you could elaborate on some of the, you know, some of the cases yeah. where you, this architecture Yeah, happy to do that. You know, the transformer that powers uh, ChatGPT is, uh, has a foundation model, a pre-trained foundation model that has been trained for only one task, which is to predict the next word in right. the conversation. Right. Uh, and yet, on top of that foundation, you can do post-training and fine-tuning for a multitude of other applications, uh, like a chatbot, but many, many uh, others. Well, that idea of a foundation model that can be generalized through post-training uh, has turned out to be viable uh, in other domains. So, for example, if you want to do biomolecular uh, dynamics, uh, one of the ideas is imagine running those classical Fortran simulations uh, uh, to do, let's say, protein folding. Mm -hmm. Hopelessly slow, uh, impractical, but very precise. Um, well, you can run those simulations to generate training data that step, time step by time step, nanosecond by nanosecond, gives you the changing configurations uh, of a protein uh, as it's folding and feed that into uh, a training uh, system to train a transformer to do the next configuration prediction mm. in the same way that we do next word prediction. Um, and the shocking thing and the exciting thing is that actually works. Yeah, that's um, amazing. And so uh, we don't quite have the internet scale data yet for that, but we can convert electricity and those Fortran codes into that internet scale sure. data and start to train, uh, train transformers uh, to do that. And that gives us a foundation model then that you know just does that kind of configuration prediction. And now we can start to try to imagine what kind of post-training, what kind of fine-tuning for specific applications, say right. in drug discovery or in disease diagnosis we might, uh, or materials design, chemistry, chemical engineering that we might have after that. Right, amazing, amazing. Well, great. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you, Don. All right. That's it, everyone. I'll talk to you next time. Bye.